and she'll take things from here. Thank you, Kate. Excellent. Thank you, Dan. Thanks, everybody. So the objective for this session today is to explore the different information streams, models, and different monitoring tools that might help us understand different fishing fleet dynamics. So information on fishing activity can be useful in a number of ways. Um, for one, understanding co-occurrence with whales and turtles that might help us meet certain management objectives like reducing entanglement risk. So we'll dive in and we'll do this through a series of presentations followed by a panel discussion. And so we're asking that all the webinar participants and panelists uh, submit questions through the question and answer uh, throughout the presentations. And then depending on timing, we'll try to take clarifying questions between the presentations and you can submit those clarifying questions throughout the discussion panel. So we'll hear about eight to 10 minute presentations from each of the speakers, and then we'll invite additional folks up to the virtual stage for the panel discussion. So uh, in this session, we're gonna be hearing presentations from Blake Feist at NOAA Fisheries Northwest Fisheries Science Center, from Owen Liu at Northwest Fisheries Science Center, and Cotton Rockwood from Point Blue Conservation, as well as Kathy George from the Marine Mammal Center. So, Blake, I will hand it over to you to kick us off first. Thanks so much, Kate, <clears throat> and thanks to everyone uh, who organized uh, this workshop. I've got my slides showing up. Does everyone see it or does someone see my presentation? Hopefully. We can, yeah, we can see our presentation. Okay. So I'm going to be chatting with you briefly today about a collaborative project I've been involved with uh, with a number of uh, science centers, uh, including West Coast Region and uh, University of Washington. We're trying to better understand the um, spatial distributions of various fixed, fixed gear fleets off the West Coast and how it relates to uh, to whale entanglement. And to remind everyone, I think everyone knows uh, whale entanglements have been on the rise in the West Coast, especially starting around 2014. And it's uh, most often implicated with pot and trap based fisheries and the most dominant uh, pot and trap fishery that is detected with whale entanglements is, is of course, Dungeness crab. So, if you want to get at to the question of, of has the fishery shifted in time or space, or is it intensified? You could look at the, uh, the landings records uh, from all the ports and we'll be focusing on Dungeness crab, spiny lobster, sable fish and spot prawn in this research. I'll be focusing on Dungeness crab mainly today because I don't have enough time. But we want to look at those those landings information for those species and see if there was anything that was coincident with coincident with the 2014 shift in entanglement reporting that might be uh, connected to the landing. So I like to refer the landings data as a whole enchilada because it's it's comprehensive information on everything that was caught and it was reported at port level for commercial fishing fishing on the uh, on the west coast. However, the uh, well, it's, it's comprehensive information. It's it's too coarse because it doesn't tell you where. The, the fishing is occurring in the water, and obviously whales don't hang out um, in, in ports, they, they hang out in the water. So you want to get some kind of a spatially explicit, uh, you want to get spatially explicit information about where fishing boats are moving when they're catching uh, the various target species. And I've listed out some of the examples you can work with. Uh, with logbook data, um, it's very detailed, you know, exactly where fishing is occurring. Uh, however, it is not available in California. And the amount of coverage for the ticket reporting uh, digitally is it varies over time. Uh, you could also use NOAA, NOAA observation observer data uh, to look at uh, these these fishing efforts. Uh, however, they, as to my knowledge, there's no observer information for uh, Dungeness crab fleets and for some of the other fixed gear fleets that we're we're interested in. A uh, more recent development for tracking vessel movement is solar loggers. Uh, those are, are an excellent source, but they're relatively recent and they have a limited spatial extent. And then moving up from that is automatic identification system, which is vessel monitoring across the entire coast. Um, again, you don't have all the vessels represented and there's a, there's a bias towards larger vessels with automatic identification system and also the coverage, uh, the number of vessels has been changing over time. Uh, finally, that, that leaves me with uh, vessel monitoring system information, which is relatively consistent over time. It's available across the West Coast. And it's about the only information we have as far as where fishing is occurring uh, specifically in California waters. So the, the rest of my presentation will be talking about how we work with the DMS data to identify where commercial fishing is occurring. 
So again, bringing us back, has the fishery shifted in time or space, or has it intensified uh, that co coincident with this dramatic increase in entanglements that started in 2014? Uh, so now we're going to be working with a piece of the enchilada because not all boats have VMS transponders on them, and that piece ranges in proportion from 10 to 95 percent, depending on which which target species uh, you're looking at. So I want to be able to link the geospatial information that's provided by VMS transponders uh, for each fishing trip uh, that with the corresponding landings data in order to identify what the boat was fishing for uh, when it was out being tracked with VMS, because the VMS doesn't tell you what the boat is fishing for, nor does it tell you uh, where they're actually fishing. So I'm going to walk you uh, quickly through how we link uh, landings data to VMS data. We'll take an example here. Let's say a fisherman landed Duncan S. Crab at Half Moon Bay. We've got an identification number for that boat, and we've got a date. You can look back at all the information that was available. This is not real VMS data, by the way, it's, it's AIS. And so you have all this information, and then you can link that unique vessel ID number and uh, what it caught. You have a look back window in time, so you can isolate a given trip. Use some filtering to then isolate, uh, use filtering of depth and vessel speeds to more isolate where you think that fishing is actively occurring. You overlay with active occurring points from VMS onto a grid. And you can generate heat maps uh, based on the density of VMS points uh, for a given trip and for a given target. And then you can, ext you can extrapolate to the entire coast, of course, and do some modeling on the distributions of fishing as it changed over time between 2009 and 2016. And also you can overlay these, these informed VMS points uh, with humpback feeding ground data that we have from Becker et al to see how the overlap has changed over time with uh, known areas of humpback whale feeding. So you get a time series, and this example is for Dungeness crab, uh, broken up into four four month increments from uh, the 2010-11 season through uh, the 2016 season. Um, and it, looking across all these years, you want to you, you want to see if there's some kind of profound change that occurred circa 2014 when entanglements uh, were dramatically increased. So the gray area is pre 2014, and the white area to the right is post uh, entanglement uh, reporting increasing dramatically. And there was nothing really profound that happened as far as fishing activity in the, in the Dungeon S crab fleets that started in 2014. Uh, however, when you look at the 2015-16 uh, season, when there was a, up to a five-month delay uh, for fishing off the coast of California, uh, that green area that I've outlined there is where there would have been heavy fishing occurring between uh, November and February of 2015 and then 2016. And then essentially all that fishing was displaced uh, later in the season. Uh, but, uh, mostly between April and June uh, of, of 2016, at a time when normally there would be very little fishing off the coast of California, and at a time when, if you look to the right then, those are the highest uh, densities of uh, humpback feeding uh, that occurs on, on the West Coast at that time. So you get a coincidence between uh, fishing activity and whales that would not have occurred otherwise. However, we didn't have this kind of coincidence prior to the marine heat wave that occurred during this time, so it's, it's, we don't really understand fully how the fishing fleet could have uh, been overlapping more with the whales, unless the whales, of course, had changed their spatial distributions. So wrapping up with the key messages of what we learned so far from these efforts, uh, we, we found that the landings informed VMS or LIVMS, as I call it, are currently the best available data source uh, for doing coastwide analyses of the fixed gear fishing activity that's most closely associated with whale entanglements. And it's, it's the best information for California as far as where fishing is occurring in the water since there isn't logbook data available for that state. Uh, the LIVMS data are a piece of the enchilada. I'd like to remind everyone, not all vessels have a VMS transponder on them. Uh, there's a bias towards larger vessels. So you're missing some of the smaller vessels more than you miss the larger vessels, but you're not missing all of them. And then the coverage is inconsistent across states. Uh, the, the coverage is around 50% in Oregon, about 30% on average in California and down around 10% in Washington. So you're getting a sample of, of what's of the, the amount of fishing that's occurring off the West Coast. And then finally, uh, the fishing activity hasn't really moved spatially from what we can tell uh, from these analyses. Uh, there were no spatiotemporal shifts in activity that occurred profoundly starting around 2014, with the exception of the profound shift that we, we noted in 2015-16 delayed opening and the California Dungeness crab fishery. And it likely is that humpbacks and the Dungeness crab fishery were fishing in the same area during that time period when they normally would have not been. And then one application I like to throw out is, is uh, doing risk assessments and then scenario assessments. And I, I encourage everyone to chime in or to just drop in and check out Jamil Samhori's presentation, module five, 
So moving forward and a little segue into Owen's talk was right after me. There's a, Owen's going to be talking about second generation modeling that we're developing uh, with the with these analyses. These further refinements uh, to the landings and form VMS data algorithms will more accurately represent where and when, how much uh, pot and trap based fishing occurs. Uh, specifically, uh, he will be incorporating tier inf information, number of pots that are carried on a boat, landed weight reported at the, at the ports, and he'll touch briefly on uh, logbook data that he's trying to also work with. And ultimately, you want to have vertical line models, obviously, that tell you uh, exactly where fishing is occurring and how it's changed over time, which you can then relate, uh, hopefully, to uh, whale distributions uh, in the area. That's what I've got to say for this morning. Um, I'd happy to take any questions if there are any, if there's any time left. Thank you, Blake, for that. That was great. Um, I think given the connection with Owens, maybe we'll flow right into Owens' presentation and then we can see if there's any clarifying questions. Great. Um, thanks a lot. Um, so I, um, Owen, I'm at the Northwest Fishery Science Center. Um, this is work similar to Blake's that's been done uh, with a number of collaborators, uh, including uh, scientists from University of Washington and the regional office. Um, as Blake mentioned, I will be chatting briefly about in-progress work that's uh, estimating vertical lines for the West Coast Dungeness crab fishery. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so I can gloss over some of this because thank you, Blake, you did an incredible job sort of teeing me up here. Um, but, you know, as as we all know, on this call, uh, whales get entangled in fishing lines. They don't get entangled in fishing effort or fishery landings or anything else. And so can we the question here is, can we kind of focus in on estimating actually the number of vertical lines? in the water uh, in any specific place at any given time. Um, again, as Blake sort of mentioned, I think that this has eventual relevance to uh, risk assessment work, uh, monitoring uh, in semi real time and um, management strategy evaluation or trying to figure out um, the potential effects of different management approaches we might take in the future to the entanglement problem. Uh, next slide. Uh, so, again, as, as Blake mentioned, these uh, data sources currently are from the VMS, so the satellite data, um, as well as fishery landings and permit information. Um, and in progress, which I won't talk much, much about today, but we'll just mention is that we also um, have some logbook data and we're working on assessing sort of the pros and cons of multiple approaches to uh, estimating spatial fishing effort. Um, next slide. Uh, so the way that we process these, uh, Blake mentioned that we organize uh, these uh, VMS data into trips. Uh, and what that means for my application is that we define a trip as sort of all of the satellite pings between a ticket that's landed at a port and the previous ticket landed by that same vessel um, or a period of seven days, um, whichever of those two is, is smaller in time. Um, after those trips are defined, then we have a set of pings, if you will, in space for each trip. And then we simulate traps along the spatial lines of that trip uh, based on linear distance traveled. Uh, for now, we are assuming 15 crab pots sort of dropped per linear mile traveled. This is sort of the first major assumption of this estimation um, and something that I am curious in sort of relaxing or building some uncertainty into this around uh, this assumption, um, but that's where uh, we're starting from. Next slide, please. Uh, so just to show you what this means, uh, sort of in practice on the left here is uh, sort of a hypothetical vessel track uh, where a vessel sort of leaves from a port, does some fishing, eventually comes back. Um, on the right is uh, sort of the likely area where we think fishing might be occurring, just sort of removing those uh, segments of the trip when we think they're just transiting to and from the port. Um, next slide. Uh, and then th this is where this assumption comes in. We literally simulate dropping the pots along this VMS track, but we include some random error or jitter, if you will, and this is to account for the fact that um, BMS pings are only about on average once every hour. 
Um, and we know that vessels are almost certainly not traveling in a direct straight line between these sort of jagged points. And so we allow the, the pops to sort of spread out um, amongst a, a small area around the track. And so the actual simulated pops for this hypothetical trip might look something like this image on the right. Uh, next slide. Uh, we then impose some coarse filters. Uh, this is another assumption of this uh, estimation. So uh, we don't allow pots to be dropped if vessels are traveling greater than um, eight and a half knots um, and uh, if they're fishing in depths greater than 100 meters. Um, additionally, uh, for California, we've included um, vessel specific tier information. Um, and so vessels can only obviously drop the number of traps, traps that they are permitted to have. Um, and for other trips or for trips where we don't have tier information, there's a maximum of 500 traps per trip. Um, as I have mentioned before, this is another assumption here. And I think that more defined filters could be used um, in the future to sort of further zoom in on where uh, and how we think uh, traps are actually being deployed um, in space. Uh, next slide. So uh, one advantage of this approach um, as a next generation to what Blake was talking about is that we can use some rules of thumb to scale up from VMS only vessels to potentially thinking about um, the entire fleet. Um, so say we want to count traps um, per month, but of course we do not observe the satellite movements of vessels that do not have VMS. Um, and we also want to avoid counting traps um, multiple times, if you will. And so the, the way that we deal with this um, is uh, to scale up and account for the traps of non-VMS vessels. Um, we weight each observed trap by the total number of vessels of a similar size class that recorded landings in that month. Um, the assumption implicit in this scaling, as you might be thinking, is that um, non-VMS vessels of a similar size class um, have the same spatial footprint of um, fishing that the VMS equipped vessels do. Um, that's an assumption we have to make at this point. Um, and second, to account for multiple trips made in a month, we um, sort of downweight each simulated trap by the total number of trips that say this vessel A took uh, in that month. Um, and this is because we do not have trip specific information on crab trap soak times. Um, and so this allows us basically to um, account or to adjust our overall estimates of traps per month um, relative to the total number of trips that that vessel took um, in that month. Uh, next slide. So just a couple of examples of how these outputs can be used. And again, this is um, very much in development, but uh, this sort of estimation can, can be uh, looked at sort of over space. So this is for um, an example season where the cooler colors here are uh, lower trap densities and the, high, and the warmer colors are higher trap densities. Um, and you can both see sort of some defined hotspots potentially here. Um, but also sort of over time from November in the top left to April in the bottom right, um, sort of a overall lowering of density of traps as the, the season progresses. Um, next, please. Uh, you could also sort of use a, an estimation like this to kind of count up total traps um, in a given area. So this is for that same sort of spatial footprint that I showed in the last slide. Um, this is sort of the total number of traps estimated from Half Moon Bay to Point Arena um, over time. And uh, you can see a couple of things here. Um, obviously, you can see the beginning of season spikes in estimated traps um, that decay quickly, and also the, the disruptions in fishing effort that occurred. For example, like Blake was talking about um, around that 2016 um, timeframe. Uh, next slide. Um, finally, uh, as an example here, we can we can compare different sorts of estimates of fishing effort. So on the left here is uh, the just the raw pings that sort of from Blake's presentation. Um, in the middle is the estimated trap density with the uh, weighting factors that I talked a little bit about. And on the right side is uh, the correlation between the two. 
Um, the good thing you could see from this right figure is that um, these these are correlated. There's a lot of red in that in that figure on the right, um, but not perfectly. And so I think that there's things that we can learn from comparing different estimates of spatial efficient effort. Um, next. Um, so I'm almost out of time here, but just to talk about um, real quickly the ways that I hope that this could be developed further and used in the future. I think that um, one application uh, is monitoring. So if we can um, adapt a model like this to be um, used in close to real time, um, then we could use it to, to think about uh, how fishing effort is evolving in space over time. Um, risk assessment. Uh, is one that uh, will be talked about more next week, um, so I won't touch on that too much. Um, and then I think that we could use uh, an estimation like this as one piece in a sort of predicting the effects of potential um, management approaches that, for example, might have a depth restriction or a spatial restriction, um, and we could think about the effect that might have on, on the ripples. And I think the last, the next slide is the last one. Um, and so moving forward, I, I've mentioned a couple of assumptions um, throughout this presentation, and I think we are interested in, in testing what happens if we change some of those or let them vary a little bit um, and see what effect that has on, on our overall estimates. Um, as I mentioned in sort of when I was talking about simulating traps, I think we could refine a little, uh, a little more precisely our definition of spatial fishing behavior. Um, so where we think um, vessels are actually dropping traps versus transiting or doing other things. Uh, and then lastly, I think there's a lot of comparison to be done to other sources of data, um, including sort of aerial trap surveys and solar logger data, which I think that the next couple of presentations uh, will touch on a little bit. So I'm excited to hear um, those presentations. Uh, and that's it for me, thanks. Thank you, Owen. I think we have time for one um, clarifying question that came in from the audience, and this could go um, to Owen or Blake. So the question is um, about the aggregated VMS data. Is it possible to make that aggregated data available in real time to some of the state convened working groups that are doing risk assessments? Um, Blake? <laughs> Well, that's an interesting question since uh, the VMS data, of course, has got confidentiality issues. Um, and so I, I know that Jamil Samhori has been working closely <clears throat> with the various uh, DFNWs trying to get the best access possible to the VMS and also with NOAA's uh, Office of Law Enforcement. And I, I think he is, he can correct me if, he, if I'm wrong, but I think he is pretty close or he's hoping to have it where you would probably get VMS data with a two week lag. Uh, I don't know if he's actually worked out a way of getting it in real time. Um, but that's a question for him, obviously. Thank you both. I think we'll keep moving along here and uh, tee up Cotton next. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Kate, and uh, to all of the organizers for the opportunity to participate in this workshop. And of course, to all the attendees for joining us. Um, I'm gonna talk about work that we've been doing at Point Blue Conservation Science uh, to demonstrate sort of a different approach and the application of data that we've actually been collecting over the last decade in Central California, um, one of the sort of highest entanglement risk areas for the Dungeness crab fishing fleet. <clears throat> um, I'd like to acknowledge my co-author, Jaime, who spoke earlier today, and, and especially all the collaborators on the Applied California Current Ecosystem Studies Research Program, um, on which this data and, and research is based, namely the great folks at all of the Greater Farallons and Cordell Bank National Marine Sanctuaries, who are our collaborators. Next slide, please. So we've heard several times already in this workshop that a uh, good quantitative understanding of whale and gear co-occurrence is key. And so I'm gonna be talking about combining those things. Um, and, and that's key to decreasing the incidence of entanglements. 
And of course, that requires data both on whale distribution and information on fisheries intensity. And then those data have to be statistically processed into spatially continuous outputs, like we just saw um, with Owen and Blake's presentations, and there's more to come. Um, and then they have to be combined together to get that picture of co-occurrence. And that co-occurrence can then be considered a basic proxy for entanglement risk and used for a whole variety of management tasks. So that's exactly what we've been doing at Point Blue. Next slide. So the Applied California Current Ecosystem Studies Access, for short, has been collecting whale counts uh, on systematic boat surveys for quite a long time. And then starting in 2008, we began counting crab pots as well. And so this is one unique part of this data set that is uh, not seen really anywhere else that I know. Of. And in addition, we also sample a number of environmental variables that can help predict where whales and fisheries occur. So to the right, you can see the extent of our cruise tracks, which are shown in the small blue points there. And though these cruises typically occur, whether allowing four months out of the year, we focus here on May and June, because those are the months, of course, that overlap with the fishery and which also have some of the highest entanglements, which you can see there in the graph at the bottom of the slide. Next slide, please. So to reiterate our methods quickly, we use statistically fit, statistical fitting of linear models to the data we have collected on the whale and crab pot distributions. And then we combine the model predictions to get co-occurrence of whales and fishing gear. Well, our whale models are actually pretty well developed. They're being validated and published. The crab pot models, on the other hand, and the co-occurrence efforts are currently proof of concept work that we really undertook without any funding. And so those results are mostly to demonstrate the potential of these data um, for ma potential management applications, but they're definitely not ready for prime time. Next slide. So because the whale models are well-developed and they've been published, I won't go into details on the methods, but here you can see the average densities that we predict for blue and humpback whales across all of the years of our surveys. Um, and you can find further details in the open access manuscript that's linked on the bottom. Next slide. For the preliminary effort in modeling crab pot fishing, uh, we fit a number of potential predictors, including bottom substrate type, um, primary productivity, and distance to port, among others. And only the um, variables that, were, that are shown here in this model formulation uh, contributed significantly ultimately to the final model. They include temporal variables, geographic variables, an upwelling ind index, which is an indicator of productivity, and ocean basin scale indicators as well of marine climate condition. And to reiterate here, we really think there's a lot of room for improvement with expanded predictors. There's a lot of things we considered but didn't have time to uh, include and greater modeling effort. Next slide, please. And so this is what uh, we get as a mean prediction of crab pot gear in those months, May and June across 2008 to 17. So this is a mean. Um, the map is overlaid with the raw survey counts represented by the different size bubbles. And, and you can see that it appears the model does a reasonable job of predicting those observations um, and gear distributions, but we definitely may be missing some of the more rare uh, occurrences of high crab pots, especially in deeper water offshore. Next slide, please. And if we look at the annual predictions, we can see notable variation between years. And we were especially glad to see that the model did a good job of predicting uh, higher densities that spread out over the continental shelf in 2016 when that fishery delay happened due to domoic acid. So now we've seen the model outputs for the whales and the fishing gear, and we can put those together to look at co-occurrence. Next slide, please. And these are the resulting average co-occurrence maps for humpback and blue whales, respectively. And they're different between the two whale species because, of course, those species have distinct distributions. 
But in both cases, we see that there is a higher co-occurrence um, predicted south of the bay entrance. And of course, a little bit just inland from the Farallon Islands, which are those um, darker dots you can see out to the west of the bay entrance. Now, for the rest of the talk, I'm going to focus on humpback whales since they are the species of highest concern for entanglement. So to evaluate the temporal performance of our co-occurrence predictions, we can compare them qualitatively to the observed entang entanglements in this same region and over the same time period that we've modeled, which is what you see here in this graph. Uh, I'll go ahead and click, click again, please. And we can compare that here to the co-occurrence predictions that we've made, um, shown in the right side, and which have been scaled so that the maximum prediction, because these are sort of unitless unit predictions, um, is equal to the maximum number of uh, observed entanglements in the left panel. Another click, please. And there are uh, a number of months um, in, in years where we don't have predictions because we had uh, weather cancellations or shortened cruises, and those are shown by asterisks. But nonetheless, we can see that especially for June months, the co-occurrence captures the general trend in increase in entanglement in recent years. So clearly there's room for improvement here. Go ahead, next slide, please. We also wanted to see if our models captured the idea that warmer years with poorer whale foraging conditions resulted in a compression of risk inshore and increased exposure to fishing gear. We heard about this idea, um, which has develop, been developed by Jaron Santora and other co-authors um, earlier today. But because this pri uh, preliminary analysis that I'm presenting here was done before Dr. Sandora's habitat compression index was published and available, we used an index of biologically available upload nutrients to divide our study years into warm slash poor years and cold slash good years. And so here you see the predictions for humpback whale distribution in those two regimes. Next slide, please. And here are the predictions for those year subsets from our crab fishing model. Next slide. And so then if we put those together and look at the co-occurrence for warm versus cold years as a proxy for risk, we do find that our model predicts higher risk in those warm slash poor years and less more dispersed risk in colder, better foraging years. And so you can start to see that these models offer the potential to look at these regime differences, as well as to dive deeper into the spatial aspects relevant to management. So for example, if risks needs to be mitigated in these warmer years, uh, perhaps there's certain areas like the high co-occurrence area outside of the and south of the bay mouth. Um, go ahead and click, please. In this area here, that could be closed while still allowing some fishing to continue. And so we think that this appro general approach could add an important tool, especially at this regional scale with really high uh, resolution modeling to um, give management another tool in their toolbox. But of course, as others have said, it is really important that there is sufficient modeling effort and validation so the, the results are really um, robust. Next slide, please. And so I just wanna finish by highlighting the importance of long-term data sets like these. Um, so, Ocean conditions is, are changing. We've heard that uh, several times as well. Uh, that's really the crux of this emerging problem. And these long-term data sets are, are really needed for a robust understanding of the continuing changes that we face. Um, and as far as I know, this access data set is unique in having um, past data on the distribution of fisheries and the, the whales being entangled, or at least some of the species. And so um, it really is a, a unique data set with a long history of those concurrently collected um, data, which is now capable of looking at this problem and, and addressing this with this type of analysis. 
Next slide, please. And so I'll just finish by thanking all of our many uh, supporters and thanking all of you for uh, your attention. Great, thank you, Cotton. Uh, I think we've got time for one question that came from the audience here. Um, and so the question is, could you give us a sense of the total amount of gear that's represented in the model for the mean gear prediction for May and June? Uh, off the top of my head, I can't provide that, uh, but it's certainly something that could be done uh, based on these models. Yeah, and just basically summing those predictions across space would, would provide that um, that number. Great. All right. Well, we'll keep moving here and we'll introduce Kathy George up next. Kathy, take it away. Thank you, Kate, and thank you to all the hosts and the organizing committee, the other speakers and the attendees for joining. My name is Kathy George, and I'm a member of the California Dungeness Crab Fishing Gear Working Group. I'm also the whale entanglement response and prevention manager at the Marine Mammal Center. And I'm gonna share a case study with you that I managed with Pelagic Data Systems. Next slide. This pilot project was actually a pilot project of another pilot project. The working group in the RAMP program, which is the risk assessment and mitigation program, made the recommendation that they wanted to understand in greater detail the fishing dynamics as well as the whale concentrations piece of the risk assessment and mitigation program and the overlap and relationship between those two variables and how they inform with whale the risk of whale entanglement. Um, as this project has progressed over time, I'm adding another goal in here for 2020 that I want to think about how solar logger technology can help meet or not meet some of the proposed regulations that are coming in California. If we can move to the next slide. This project was started in 2018. I'm in process of extending it through August of 2021 to cover this entire fishing season. Um, as I mentioned, this was an extension of a pilot project. Um, the extension was to include 40 commercial fishermen representing all of the ports in the Dungeness crab fishery. Um, to date, I have 25 participants of those 40 participants, and I will add that at least half of those participants have come in recent months. So prior to analysis and reporting that you're gonna see in a few minutes. So I wanna thank all of the volunteer fishermen as well as the whale watch organizations that are participating in this project. I have 10 to 20 whale watch organizations participating. And again, about half of those came in recent months. So their data was not included in previous analyses and reports. Um, I wanna thank the working group for all of their support and feedback throughout this project. Um, they review reports that Plagic Data System provides on a monthly basis to help inform that risk assessment. Plagic Data Systems has provided the solar loggers. They're securing all of the data. They've done all of the analysis to date, as well as provided the output reports. The Ocean Protection Council has funded this project. The Nature Conservancy has provided additional support to really refine the fishing algorithm that Pelagic uses to only include Dungeness crab fishing. Happy Whale is providing whale sightings into the output, and we've been working closely with the department as well. Next slide. So this is an overview of the solar logger functionality. The solar logger itself is seven inches long, three inches wide, and one inch tall. It's a pretty small device, weighs about 12 ounces. It's really easy to install. All you need is a sunny spot on your boat and four screws or several zip ties, and you have it installed there, and there's no additional maintenance that's needed to be done once it is installed. The solar logger runs off of solar power, and it collects your positional information every few seconds. This information is then uploaded via the cellular network. It goes through the GSM cellular network, and this is the same cellular network that AT&T and T-Mobile use. From the cellular network, it goes to the cloud at Pelagic Data Systems. Um, I really wanna highlight that the data is encrypted, it's secure, and access is controlled by each participant in this project. So um, there's no 
need to be concerned about any privacy issues if you are participating in this project. And I know that's been a key comment that I've heard from participants and potential participants, but the data is secure. Um, while the data is at Pelagic Data Systems and in the cloud, you can retrieve information about your trips as well as the analyses that Pelagic is doing, and you can view it on, a, on their dashboard. So I'm going to go ahead to the next screen. This is Pelagic's uh, screenshot of the portal. Um, what I want to highlight here, and I want to thank Dick for allowing me to share his data with the with everyone today, but you can download information. This is a single trip that you're looking at. On the right hand side is actually a, is a visualization of that trip based on the solar logger positional pings. And this trip can be animated. In another slide, I will reference this and we'll come back to it. But I just want to show what a single trip looks like. You have the opportunity to download your trips and you can download all of your data points associated with those trips. So thinking about regulations in the future and needing to share your positional information. This is all possible through the Pelagic Data Systems portal, and this does not have any outside manual manipulation happening with it. The next slides that I'm going to show do show reports that are done manually and created outside of the systems. So these are some samples of reports that the working group reviews on a monthly basis to help with the risk determination. On the left-hand side is a fishing trip activity. And what you see, the white lines are the vessel transiting lines and the purple area is the fishing area. So this is what Pelagic Data Systems algorithm detects, the transiting versus fishing. And they use speed and movement pattern to determine that fishing effort. On the right-hand side is uh, each hexagon represents hours that a boat has spent in that area. So the lighter the color of each hexagon, the less lesser hours, the darker, the darker hours. And one thing that I wanna highlight, you can see, and maybe you can't see, but I could see, um, the bathymetry is included in these maps, but depth is not a data element that is included in the database currently. We know that's something that's going to be important kind of moving forward, but um, just want to highlight that today it's being done, but just as an overlay. Next slide, please. This is an example of the fishing effort map. Again, it takes those purple fishing areas from the previous map and puts it in a hexagon and shows the hours that are spent fishing. And one thing that I do want to highlight, while these maps have great potential here, it we have had limited participation and limited data sets going into this, so it's really hard to determine scale. And that's something that we need to do as this project moves forward to determine what is the right scale that we should be showing this data at, and is this the right type of reporting that will help management. Next slide. Um, we have similar maps for the whale watching portion. This is just hours that the whale watch boat has spent in an area. Next slide. And these are raw vessel tracks for both fishing and whale watching. The blue tracks are whale watch tracks and the green are fishing tracks. If we did have whale sightings, they would be seen along with the whale sightings tracks. Next slide, please. So some of the pro project challenges and observations that I wanted to share with everyone today is there have been unclear management objectives and we've had low participation in this pilot project. Um, we had in the low teens participants and a low number of trips that were included in all the reporting and analysis. This project kind of also kicked off with maps around the time of the lawsuit settlement. There has been the pandemic that we've all been going through, and I know a lot of the whale watching boats and the fishing boats were kept at port for a while. So there's been a number of hurdles that we have tried to overcome, and I think we're starting to get there now, but really this low participation really makes it hard to show data at a meaningful scale. And we've had no whale sightings recorded in any of the fishing areas. Um, some area for improvement as we move forward. 
And I just want to highlight that some manual effort is going to be required when you're working with solar logger data. All of the data is automatically collected, but it does need to be handled sometimes. And we've been working with the fishermen to refine the algorithm to detect Dungeness crab fishing trips only, and that is helping improve the machine learning of the algorithm. All of the monthly reports are created manually, and there's an opportunity here for creating scripts to get depth and other key data elements. If we move to the next slide, um, on the right hand side is that video I mentioned from the Pelagic Data Systems portal. You can go ahead and play that. This is just animating the trip. You could sped up a thousand times. You can see the vessel transiting there. And if you note here, it wiggles slightly. And that wiggling is the fishing activity. So I asked Pelagic Data Systems with Dick's permission if they can give me an extract of the fishing only data points so we could see the depth at which he was fishing. They exported the file and just in this one particular trip, because we are getting positional information every few seconds, there were over 16,000 data points that said they were that said fishing was occurring. I worked with Point Blue Conservation Science and again, with Dick's permission, I ran the latitude and longitude through a script they've developed that queries a NOAA database and it was able to give me back the depth that was in fishing. And I think there's a lot of opportunity that we could do once we have depth included with this data and looking at how the fishery moves with depth over time. And I'm interested in exploring some of those other avenues. Next slide, please. So the next steps for this project are completing this project with the fishery and increased participation. I'm hoping that I can even increase those participation numbers as we get closer to the start of the season. We're working with the California Department of Fish and Life to provide solar loggers to participants in DA testing as well as quality testing. I think there's an opportunity here to really explore and refine what this data can do. We've had a little opportunity to digest some of the maps we've been getting look at some of the data. We have some new regulations coming forward, kind of how do we want to be using this tool in terms of management perspective? I think that there is an opportunity here to be collaborating with others. I'm really grateful to, that this workshop is West Coast wide. I've been talking with Dave Culpel recently, and he's been exploring other solar loggers. He's worked with, he's worked with Pelagic Data Systems in the past and has done analysis and output on their particular data. So I think there's a lot that we can learn from each other by collaborating, by not reinventing the wheel, by sharing our lessons learned. And I also want to think about this device it has been useful for kind of giving positional information and we see it benefiting DA testing and quality testing. Are there other uses for solar loggers that involve vessels? And the last thing that I want to say, and this is a little bit outside of my pay grade, but I think it's a nice opportunity for the fishermen that solar loggers and the Pelagic data systems analysis has been able to show us when vessels are transiting versus when they're fishing. And currently vessels can't transit closed areas. So if the department would allow it in the future, this provides an opportunity to, for fishermen to transit closed areas. Next slide. Um, we can go ahead and skip this slide because I know we're running short on time and move to my last slide, but I just want to thank everyone for their attendance today and I welcome any questions and I look forward to future collaborations. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Kathy. Um, thank you to all the presenters. We've actually got a couple of minutes here before we move into the panel discussion. So I've got a couple of questions, mostly clarifying questions from the audience that I'll try to get through before we move into the panel. And I'll just encourage all the participants to please keep submitting questions through the Q&A chat if you have them, and we'll keep trying to get those in. So um, I guess first up, Kathy, uh, one question for you for the solar logger data. Um, is it assumed that speed reductions are actually due to fishing activity or how do you take into account other types of speed reductions that might be from a mechanical issue or some other factor is that is that taken into account currently 
That is a great question. I really wish I had my Pelagic Data Systems teammate here to answer that question for you. Um, right now, it's all all the data is being analyzed based on the speed. And unless a fisherman goes into the portal or someone goes into the portal on behalf of the fisherman and makes a note that that part that is not fishing, it's being assumed that if there was a boat mechanical issue, that there it was being counted as a fishing. So there was potent there's potential for some error. But there is an opportunity to fix that as well. Got it. Great. Thank you, Kathy. Um, and one other question for you about the whale watching boat tracks. Are those combined with the whale sightings? And how does that actually happen? Is it done manually 